Hello and welcome to Life Church Today. Life Church Today wants to make a lasting difference in your life, in our community, and in the world. Our mission is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's how Life Church Today is able to make a difference in the lives of so many people, and it's the motivating dynamic behind everything that we do. You see, church isn't merely a building, it's the people. So we aim to bring church to you. We meet around the globe online and in physical locations throughout America. No matter how and where you join Life Church today, you will find friendly people who are excited to get to know you as you become part of the Life Church family. And wherever you are in life, you matter to God and you have a purpose to fulfill. Life Church today wants to help you become the person God has created you to be. Every journey, including yours, has a next phase and will help you discover it. It could start with simple things like serving, praying, or writing, finding God's vision for you. You will not have to take the next step by yourself. With a solid community of friends, you can smile, grow, and serve with people who sincerely care about you. Enjoy the sermons, read the devotions, reach out and contact us. We respond to every single person who writes us or find a group to join you on your faith journey. Worship, give, and love. Our community and world. We are excited about serving the world's community and offering God's love to people of all backgrounds, whether online, in person, individually, or in groups. Within our church and around the globe, we are focused on supporting and engaging in relationships that provide assistance and restoration to the hurting world. Our caring leadership team, including lead pastor Mike Robinson, works together to shape the vision and direction of Life Church today. Pastor Robinson, author of 40 books, serves with a team of enthusiastic and educated ministers using their numerous years' experience. They aim to serve you and your whole family. Visit lifechurchtoday.com. Welcome to Cross and Crown Radio and the Gospel Truth Podcast. I'm Mike Robinson, your host. This particular uh, broadcast is starting on Facebook, but our goal, of course, is putting on YouTube where we have our larger audience. So welcome for those who are on Facebook and also those who are watching YouTube. And if you're watching YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. It's at the top of your channel. We appreciate that. And then press the knob that looks similar to a bell. We know that's for the YouTube audience, but this is a Facebook, so we appreciate you joining us. We're going to be talking about love. Uh, hello, Leroy and Dave. And we're going to be talking about the love that we have following Jesus and how we apply that, how we walk in that, and going from there. Anybody would know that reading the Bible just in a very uh, you know, standard way, you're going to see that love is huge. It's very, very important when it comes to the Christian life. That's very clear. It's throughout the whole Bible, including the Old Testament, and it's very, very strongly stated over and over again in the New Testament. We know that we should love, that the Bible says that God is love. Of course, that's an attribute of God, and so love for it to be eternal has to be based and grounded in God, and the good news is, it is. And so we know that since it's part of God's nature that someday when we're in heaven, God's not going to all of a sudden say, you know what, I, I don't love that guy or that gal anymore. No, his love is part of his nature. His nature is eternal. So that's good news for us to know that he loves us that much. Now, love in the Greek language, remember the New Testament is written in Greek. Love is used uh, numerous ways in Greek language, but in the Bible it's used mainly only two ways. There's at least four different Greek words at the time of Jesus that were utilized for love. Some scholars say there was even more, up to six or seven, perhaps even more than that. But in New Testament times, the word eros was a word that was used for love. That would stand for sensual love or sexual love. The New Testament never utilizes that word. There's nothing wrong with sensual love if it's within the covenant marriage. We know that. That's fine. But the Bible doesn't uh, talk about that specific love in the New Testament. There's also a word called storge, which the New Testament also doesn't utilize, except it does in a compound way a couple times. Storge, only when it's compounded. So it's not used straight out. But the two words that are used in the New Testament are phileo and agape. And most of you have heard those words before. 
Phileo is kind of the stepchild of agape, if you will, that we kind of look down on that. In a sense, we all understand why. But just because something's greater and wonderful doesn't mean that something else is not also really good. It may not be as good. You know, if you had a billion dollars, you know, that would be great. But if you had a hundred million, that's still pretty good, right? So phileo is a love that signifies a friendship love. It's also sometimes utilized in a spontaneous affection uh, with more of a feeling, more of an emotion than reason. So it's not quite as rational, okay? Strong says that phileo is to be a friend. And in the United States, we get the, the particular town or city called Philadelphia as a town of brotherly love. That's where it comes from, phileo, Philadelphia. So that's one of the words that's used in the New Testament for love, phileo. It's a friendship love. But the main word that we, use, we see used over and over in the New Testament, the one that it says that God is love, is the word agape and all the words that flow from that root word. I'm going to use agape even though in certain contexts within the text it would be a different word but with the same root as agape. Agape is a word for love. It's used more often than any other word. It's not an erotic or sensual or self-centered love. It doesn't say that the focus of my love is myself like eros might. And it's more than just a friendship love, although it could include friendship, but it also transcends friendship and encompasses friendship also. It says this, I give love because I receive love. That's what the world says. But agape is, I'm going to give you my love whether you give me it back or not. God so loved the world. We, we know that's where it starts from, that God first loved us. So we see that in the New Testament. And then Jesus says, as I have loved you, go and love one another. And I've been in churches from Hawaii to California, been able to pastor churches in Las Vegas and in Texas. And I'm telling you, most churches that I've seen, I'm not saying it's, uh, you know, it's just one person. I've seen, oh golly, probably at least a hundred different churches in a fairly a significant way. And I would say that most of those churches, love is missing in a big way. That we tend to stand for our agenda, for our rights, and we hear a sermon on agape, and we say, you know what, that's really good, that's really wonderful, and yeah, I'll, I'll try to, to, to kind of dabble in that here or there, but that's not what God's calling us to do. God's calling us to have this agape love every single day as we follow Jesus, because Jesus has that kind of love for us. So agape is a kind of love which God has for us, and because he has that love for us, and because the Holy Spirit dwells in our heart by faith, that Jesus is also within us, so that agape love is already inside us, so we, by faith, through his grace, need to share that love. We need to get really, really radical with this. We need to be those who are really, really Jesus-styled. And we don't need to be, well, look at all these other churchgoers, look at all of this, they're not doing it, they're, you know, they're doing their thing. It doesn't matter. Right now, you're watching this show, and I'm talking about this, and I, as well as you, we all need to get really radical with this to say, you know what, God's kind of love is what I am now committed to. I'm committed to it every single day. I know I'll blow it. I know I have my flaws. I know sometimes I will mess up. But you know what? Then I will come back and aim again for agape love. That's what I want to do with my family, with my spouse if I'm married, with my church members, and with those that are in my extended family, perhaps my neighborhood, and people in the marketplace. That I want to have this kind of love. So let's go through the charter for love, the charter for agape. And I'm sure most of my Christian audience knows where that starts, and that's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And so 1 Corinthians 13 tells us right off the bat, starting with verse 4, that love is patient, or an older version says that love suffers long. And that is actually the literal translation. Notice what it says, love suffers long. Well, he did that to me, so too bad, I'm done. Well, that's not a love that's suffering long. Now, that love suffering long doesn't mean that if somebody did something against you, against God's word, that you don't, after praying for them, speak to them about that. You do. You don't want to see something 
constantly happen that might be sin against you. But yet your relationship with that person, whether it's your spouse, your family, your loved ones, your friends, your love has to suffer long. The particular word there is macrothume. And you, and you can see that thume, which is a word where we get passion or suffering. Remember, in Jesus' day, the word passion would also mean suffering. So love suffers long. Now, if you're going to get married, if you're thinking about getting married, don't get married if you can't have a love that suffers long. This is part of the, the charter on love. This is part of the covenant document in the New Testament. Hey, Brianna. Hey, George. Hey, Geronimo. Love must suffer long. That's what it says. Now, it also says next that love is kind. Now, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say love is nice. Sometimes, in some ways, love can be nice, and, and that's good. It, it, it's, it, it's well uh, for our soul and those others sometimes to be sweet to other people. But love, it doesn't say, is sweet. It doesn't say it's nice. It says it's kind. Why? Because under the, the, the term kindness, sometimes you might have to speak difficult things to people. You might have to do troubling things to them if they don't like it because it's part of God's word. It's part of God's plan. And so tough love is kindness, but it's not niceness. Niceness sometimes is there, you know, buying your loved one some flowers, mowing the lawn for your mother, your father, washing a car, whatever. Love obviously can be nice. And that's good, but love is kind. That's what the Bible says. The word there is krestos, which means a kindness that doesn't just have this uh, gentleness to it, although there is a gentleness within it, but it, it, it has a broad range of meaning. So you can go from A to Z on this kindness. It's not just limited to certain things, but it can be, like I said earlier, tough love or it can be gentle love. And everything in between and then 1st Corinthians 13 tells us that love does not envy this particular word is a wonderful Greek word uzoze. and what it is it's a particular word that means it's not going to boil over into envy or jealousy jealousy often in the Bible is about a, a boiling within your heart and your passions against somebody or for somebody or for something somebody has. But love does not envy, okay? We need to understand that. If you start finding yourself envious of somebody or something, then you need to step back and what the Bible says, repent. Yeah, I know that's a word you, most people don't like to hear anymore, but it's a biblical word. What it means is it literally to change your mind. So you change your mind, which then changes your direction. You don't change your direction to change your mind, but you change your mind to change your direction. So that's a biblical view of repentance. And then it goes on to say, 1 Corinthians 13, so we see that love suffers long, love is kind, love does not envy, and then it says love is not puffed up. You know, th this means that you would have an instrument with, with air that would, would make air and would start puffing up something. That was a term that was used in the Greek. And love is not like that. You don't puff out yourself and say, I'm all of this. Look at me. I'm worthy of your love because of all that I've done for you. No, love is not puffed up. Love does a lot of things without telling others because love does not also boast. So you don't have to broadcast everything you do for those that you love. If you do the dishes and they never noticed, you know what? You don't have to announce everybody. Guess what? All your dirty dishes that were in the sink, I did it. You know, no, 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 no. Love is not puffed up. So you don't have to do that. You don't have to parade yourself. You don't have to brag about yourself. If you do, at that point, you're not being loving. Now, we know within the churches in America, especially, we need more and more leaders, as well as just your lay Christians who are humble, who don't have to do this because it's all about them, but that we go into the church, whether it's a congregation or just in our daily life, with the idea of glorifying God. It's not about glorifying me, that as pastors and ministers, the people aren't there for me, but the pastor is supposed to be a minister. The word minister means servant. We are to serve the church. The church isn't there for us. Yes, the church can also serve the pastor, but the, the starting point, the foundation must be, because who Christ is as the servant, 
the pastor and the leaders must serve the church. And of course, we don't see that too often, unfortunately, these days. So it's not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly or rudely. This word also means indecent. So love is not indecent. It is not rude. When you're being rude to your loved ones, you're not loving them at that point. Okay? So again, you step back and you, you repent. That's what you do. Because again, God calls us to love like Jesus loved. Not love like our neighbor does. We don't compare ourselves to the na our neighbor. We don't co compare ourselves to other church members. But we say, you know what? Whatever Jesus does, whatever Jesus did, that's what I want to do. Because I'm a Christian. I'm one who follows Jesus. So I'm a, I have a love that I want to aim for. A love that suffers long. A love that is kind or gracious. A love that does not envy. It, it, you know, it doesn't have this rudeness in it. It doesn't parade itself. It doesn't vault itself up, which is related to vainglory. It's not puffed up. It doesn't brag. It doesn't boast. And it doesn't behave rudely. It's not unseemly. And then this is a really, really good one, especially those folks that might have an anger problem. And we understand that, that some things are kind of genetic or maybe you're under a lot of stress, but you still don't want to give yourself an excuse Anytime you give yourself an excuse why you can be angry or depressed or anxious or whatever it is, then you're going to do it more often. What you have to do is what the Bible says, die to yourself, which means, and I know this is some hard stuff and it's not as pleasant as some people might like to hear, but you have to die to yourself and you have to hate the sin. Until you hate your sin and no longer accept it in yourself, you're going to keep doing it. Well, that's just how I am. I've always been this way. Well, if you're a Christian, Jesus lives in your heart. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay? So don't give yourself an excuse, but repent. Yeah, that's another harsh word. I know you're hearing some tough stuff, but this is Bible stuff. This is truth, and that's what we have to go for. And if it's unpleasant, then you know what? Perhaps you've never been saved. Perhaps you don't like the things that Scripture says. Perhaps you need to reevaluate yourself. Paul says to examine yourself. So we must examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. First John is a great book. If you think that you're kind of a moderate Christian, a kind of a compromising Christian, a kind of a fleshly Christian, I would encourage you to read First John. Read the book. It won't take that long. And it will outline before you all these things that you should have in your life if you're truly born of God. And then when you come to the end of that book, if you've been, if it's been shown to you and revealed to you that you're way outside this, then repent and say, Jesus, please forgive me for all of this. I'm going forward and I'm going forward to follow you with agape love. I'm going to, to see your love move in my heart and my touch and my voice and, and all of my days. That's what I want to do. I'm not going to give myself any excuses anymore. I'm going to hate those bad things I've done in the past and love following you. Because it's, it's a great delight to follow Jesus. It's, it's a wonder and a marvel to step out of your house and to go to work and to know that you've got a chance to demonstrate the love of Jesus to other people. Well, they don't deserve it. I know. We didn't deserve to get Jesus' love. So we love those people that don't deserve it. Even those within our own household that sometime may be doing things against us. They don't deserve it. We, we love them. Again, especially within covenant relationships, it doesn't mean you accept sin or accept ongoing um, areas where someone's breaking God's word. You approach them with patience and gentleness and tell them what they're doing. Tell them this is what you see and this is what the Bible says. Yes, you do that. But love is patient, okay? And love is kind. Love suffers long. And then it says it's not easily provoked, okay? So it's not. So if someone lost the, um, the channel changer, you don't get in a rage. Where's that channel changer? My football game's on. Okay? <laughs> no. Love is not easily provoked. Where's my fork at the table? You know, no. Love is not easily provoked. Oh, that guy cut me off. Love is not easily provoked. Oh, I can't believe my kid left my car on empty again. Love is not easily provoked, okay? If, it, if you're easily provoked, again, catch yourself, repent, hate that sin, really despise it, loathe that sin, 
and be determined. This is the words Paul used. I'm, de I'm determined, he would say often. Be determined not to do that again. And then it says that love keeps no record of wrongs. I love this. This relates to the word justification. In our justification, which is a huge doctrine, it's one of the top doctrines in the whole Bible. It goes from Genesis to the Psalms, to Romans, to, to the book of Luke, to Corinthians, to Galatians, and on and on. It's huge in the Bible, dozens and dozens of places. Justification, even if you haven't heard of it, because a lot of churches don't teach about it much anymore, it means that you're declared righteous. Okay, that's what it means. So all your sins are washed away, rinsed away by the blood of Jesus, because he died on the cross for your sins. That's what's called expiation. Don't worry too much about that term right now, but think of justification. So in my justification, all my sins are washed away. That's what's called the negative aspect of justification. What's subtracted are my sins. Okay, they're gone. And now God doesn't just leave you there, but he imputes the righteousness of Christ. If you've ever wondered, you know what? Jesus lived to be in his 30s. I wonder why they didn't allow him to be killed as a baby. Why couldn't he? Why could God not have prophesied that type of death for him? Why couldn't he have died as a young child and so forth? Well, one reason, not the only reason, but one reason Jesus lived to adulthood was so he could fulfill every jot and tittle of the law of God. All the commandments of God, Jesus did perfectly in thought, word, and deed. Perfectly. That record, if you will, kind of like a report card, if you will, with the 613 laws of Torah, of the Old Testament, all those laws, Jesus fulfilled them perfectly. That record that Jesus made is given to us. It's what the Bible says, imputed to us. So it's now our account. So his report card is now my report card. My report card is washed away and rinsed away. And now when God looks at Mike Robinson, he sees a report card of Jesus, so I get to heaven because of Christ alone. And that's good news. Now, you probably heard me mention the term imputation. Logosome. That's the word. That's a Greek word. It's related to the word logos. It's an accounting term. And notice what it says here in 1 Corinthians 13, that love keeps no record of wrongs. That has the same root word as imputation. So what you do, you don't impute other people sin to their account. Even though they've sinned against you, maybe they've sinned against your home, they've done things, they're flawed like you and I are. They have their foibles, they have their miscues, <clears throat> they have their mistakes, their failures. You don't keep record of wrongs. Now, if they're ongoingly in the midst of a particular sin, then yes, you have to bring it up, okay? But once they're done with that sin, say they... Um, they didn't empty the trash for quite a few weeks and 10 years ago. And then one day they don't empty the trash, but they've been doing it faithfully for years. Oh man, you never emptied the trash. 10 years ago, you never emptied. No, no, no. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You give them that, that one mistake and you probably don't even bring it up, right? Now, if it's a pattern, that's where you kind of intervene and mention to somebody, you know, you're doing this area, you know, wrong. Perhaps you can come back and, and do these things right. If they're breaking God's commandments, you... You lead them back to it. But you tend to, to deal with things that are more of a pattern than somebody making one mistake. You know, so if they have a pattern of anger, a pattern of anxiety, a pattern of depression, a pattern of worrying, a pattern of gossip, you know, then you got to chat with them. But, you know, uh, don't keep a record of wrongs. It's very devastating, especially for a family. Teenagers, your children, don't keep record of wrongs. Don't do that. You know, the law, remember, Romans tells us, when you press the law on somebody, we need to do that at times. But if you press the law and that's all you're giving them, you're not giving them mercy and the grace, just pressing the law on them. The Bible says the law gives us the propensity to break the law. That's in the book of Romans. So be careful with the law. The Bible says in Timothy that the law is good if we use the law lawfully or correctly. So be careful with that. I remember... I was counseling this one family, this, this gentleman, strong Christian, said, Mike, would you come to my house and, and counsel my family? We're having some issues. I said, yeah, of course. So I, we made an appointment. I went to his house. I walk into this house. It's a middle-class neighborhood. And I walk into, and the first thing I see in his living room, facing the dining table, is this huge wall with all the house rules. And he had quite a few house rules. 
I, mean, I can't remember how many. It filled the whole wall. He wrote on the wall all these rules, right? And I'm thinking, oh my, okay. And those that law was facing them at the dinner table. So all, all the time that they walk into the house, they see these laws, these house rules. All the time they're eating the dinner, the house rules loom over them. Okay, and that was one reason, not the only reason. And some of his rules were good, you know. But you got to be careful with how you utilize the law. The law is good if it's used lawfully or correctly or rightly. We know that. We are those who obey God's commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So this is what we strive for. This is what we aim for. Not because it, it, it makes us acceptable to God. No, we're accepted by the cross alone, through Christ alone, period. By his grace alone. We know that. We trust him. But because we trust him, now we follow him. Remember the three G's, guilt, grace, and gratitude. Guilt, I blew it. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. God's grace, he sent a savior to die for me. I trust in him. And now I'm saved. I have a place in heaven because of grace alone. But now that I have, I have this grace and now that I'm saved, I follow God and his word out of gratitude. Three G's, guilt, grace, and gratitude. Great way to explain the Christian life to those folks that you might not have that much time with, say you're on a, a bus or waiting in line at a bank or something, and, and they ask you, what, how would you sum up the Christian life? That's a good way to do it, and throw the gospel in there, there with the guilt and the grace. Okay, now here we go. We're getting near the end of 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 7 says this, Love bears all things. <laughs> I love that. It bears all things. My wife and I have been married for decades, and one reason is because love bears all things. Things can get difficult. Things can be troubling. There could be some challenges that you never, never saw. You know, some people get some health challenges. Some people get financial challenges. Some people have challenges with their teenagers or their, their kids. We know that this is part of life, and it can be very, very troubling, very difficult. But see, your love that you have for your, your spouse and those in your family bears all things. doesn't mean that you accept all things if they're Doing certain things, you must must take action. But this particular word, bear all things, is where we get, it, it, it's a word in the Greek for roof. It's like a roof where the, the family's inside and the, and the storm is going and at first the rain is pounding and you're protected from the roof. It, it's bearing you away from that, the rain and then the, the hail comes and the, the lightning, the storms roll in and, and, and the winds roll in. And that roof is sheltering you, protecting you, keeping you secure from the elements. And love, that's what that's meaning. Love bears all things. And it really, really has to. If you're about to marry somebody and your love is not going to bear all things, then don't get married. Don't do it. You know, find somebody else. Find somebody that you can say with Jesus Christ, with this person, I can bear all things with them. And I'm going to do that. Then it says that love believes all things. What that means, it's, it's not a gullible, that word doesn't mean a gullible thing, but what it means is I trust you. When I get to the altar and we say I do's, after I say that, that those I do's, I'm now in a covenant relationship with you. And unless the evidence comes forth that I shouldn't, I'm gonna trust you. I'm not gonna be overly suspicious. I'm not gonna have to read your phone all the time. Now, if you've sinned and you've made some mistakes and we all know it, and then I need to, to check up on you. That's different. If you've fallen, you can't get mad at other people for checking up on you. Okay, that was your mistake. That was your sin. And so people, they want to protect you and they want to protect themselves, especially when our, with our teenagers. But you have to have the attitude that, you know what, going in this relationship, I'm going to trust you. If you don't, then don't get in. It. Okay. Then 1 Corinthians 13 goes on to say, love hopes all things. It does. When you get in that relationship, whether it's new children in your family or it's when you're getting married, you have to have a, lo a love that says, you know what, we're not going to get divorced in a year, you know, but I'm hoping all things. My, my wife and I, when we first got married, we, we had some pretty deep issues there and we were counseled by this team, a uh, husband and a wife, been Christian counselors for decades, and they said, as we started the counseling, they've never counseled anybody ever to get a divorce, and they're never going to. At least that's what they said. But after about the third week with us, they said, you know what? I, I got to tell you guys, they both said it. We're both in unison. You two should get divorced. 
Okay. Now, maybe that was a strategy. I don't know. But um, it was that bad. But Don and I, my wife, even back then, decades ago, we were, we were committed to 1 Corinthians 13. It was read at our marriage. We affirmed it. We embraced it. We delight in it. And we were going to do that. And so we hoped and had hope that our marriage is going to work out. And it did. And four kids later, four wonderful kids later, uh, we're glad that it did. We've been able to minister in uh, numerous churches and be able to touch many people. And a lot of that is because love hopes all things. And then as we get near the close of 1 Corinthians 13, the Bible, the, gr the greatest charter of love ever given, says this, love never fails. Wow. See, your love should never fail. It should not. Well, you know what? I'm kind of bored of you. You know, I'm, I'm having this midnight crisis, so I'm done, you know. Uh, you know, it's, we just don't have that same spark anymore. No, 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 no. Love never fails. See, love is not just an emotion. It's a decision. It's not only a decision, but part of it is a decision. A covenant decision that you say, I'm going to love this person. My love's never going to fail. I'm not going to think, well, man, things have gotten boring. You know what? I, I see my 25-year-old secretary and that's what... No, 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 no. Your love should never, ever fail. It's a love that the Bible says is the greatest of these, which is love. Paul says, let me show you a more excellent way, love. And so that's the most excellent way to have this agape love, this unconditional love, this transcendent love, this eternal, infinite love, the love that God has for us. Jesus said this about love. By this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And like I mentioned earlier, being in the church for a few decades now, being a leader in the church, I've seen this verse work really well in some of the churches I've been blessed to uh, lead, but I haven't seen it, and I know that might sound boastful, I don't mean to, I'm just trying to be honest. I've seen a lot of churches, and they have some really good points, but I've seen a lot of problems with this, where people aren't loving one another, that there's a millionaire on that row, and then there's a guy who's got no money, and the millionaire never even thinks to buy the guy lunch or maybe talk to him and see if there's anything he could do for him. Yes, we do know that some people that are in um, trouble financially, they got there themselves. Many times that might be the case. It's not always the case. And maybe that person has seen the errors of their ways and you can be a person that can help them get back on their feet. I think people that have a ton of money, they have a ministry. You know, you might have other ministries in your life, but if you have a ton of money, if you have millions of dollars or so, that is not just for you to, to have stored up for yourself, but God has given that to you. Well, I worked hard for it. Yeah, you did. I'm educated. Well, okay, that's fine. But you have that, that, that money as a ministry, and you have to be one who's going to be held account of it later when you see God. And so you, it doesn't mean you give it all away. Jesus said that to certain people, but not as a universal moral absolute but at times there is a place to help other people even though it costs you some you know if say you had 10 million dollars and there's some people in your life that really really need some help how much is it really going to hurt you to use two million dollars in a very strategic way in a prayerful way maybe talking to some elders or pastors in your church and having plans and programs help some of the poor people out I don't mean just hand them 50 grand. That could be a disaster for some people. But there's ways of, of helping them and educating them and carrying them along. Because maybe you made that money because you're very, very smart. You're very good in business. If that's the, the case, then perhaps you can help share that with other people. Not just the money, but also the, the, the means of how you made that money and how you kept the money and, and so forth. So there's so many rich Christians I mean, they're, oh my, in my little town, we got a tremendous amount of rich Christians. Some of them do a lot of good charity work. We know that. A lot of them do. Maybe not percentage-wise, but a numerous, countless Christians in our town and other towns do. But by percentage, the amount of money that so many people hoard, do you really need 50 million bucks in the bank? 
Perhaps for some business reasons, okay. But most people, do they really need 100 million bucks? Do they really need $20 million? Uh, it, it's just hard for me to see that. It, it would be hard for me to, to have that kind of money and give an account to God why I had all this money. Again, you have probably some relatives and some children and some heirs. I know that. I'm not talking about that. And if they don't have their own, um, you know, uh, money saved and, and you might have to help them with your with an inheritance, that, that's fine. But man, you could, you could parse out some money to do good things. Yeah, that's easy for you to say. Yeah, I know, I know, I, I, I don't have that kind of money, so I, it, it's, it's not for me to have to do. But if you do, whether you like what I'm saying or not, you have a ministry with that money. You might have other ministries that you're doing, and that's good. But there's one ministry, and that's utilizing and dispensing that, that money correctly for God's glory. Again, I'm not saying give it all away. I'm not even saying give it most of it away. That's between you and God. But depending on how much you have, if you have a few million bucks or more, huh? You should be uh, having some kind of plan and program to help those around your life that are doing so well. If you're a Christian, you're to love others. You really, really are. You have to be loving others. That's what Jesus did. Nobody loved like Jesus, and he calls us to do that same kind of love. When I look at my life, I have to admit, 90% of the time I'm not loving like Jesus loved. Maybe more. Maybe my 10% is, is, is pride. But... I want to 100%. That's my goal. That's my aim. I want that every single day. I truly do. I've seen flashes of it. I've seen flashes of it increase at times. And sometimes when it comes to loving the way Jesus loved, it's five steps forward and then maybe four steps back. I understand that. But you know what? I am not going to give myself an excuse not to be a loving person. And so love suffers long. Love never fails. Love endures all things. Love is kind. These type of things we must embrace in our life. To know this. To know that God loves us with a love that is greater and deeper and more transcendent than any love that we've ever received from a human. I've had the chance and the opportunity to talk to numerous people over the years about love the love that they felt for god and we all know the apologetic that the proof and the evidence for god is astounding it's compelling it's it's more than convincing it's sure and certain we know that the certitude is just mind-blowing but you know what without jesus and without his love you could have it all <laughs> i don't want it without jesus with jesus it makes loving others easier and it makes it worth it because when you're reaching out and touching somebody, it's the Lord inside you doing that. And there's something that comes over you, something so transcendent, something so powerful, that sometimes it's beyond words. When you've touched that young lady there, or that guy there, or maybe the homeless gentleman over there, or maybe that needy family there, um, you know that. You, you've felt it, you've seen it, and you know that the love of God it's so wonderful, it's so powerful, and it's what life is all about. And it's what we should be doing every single day. And for me, in my, my house, in my future, what I want is a love that suffers long for others. I want a love that is kind, it's gracious. I want a love that keeps no record of wrongs. I want a love that never, ever fails. I want a love that endures all things. I want a love like Jesus loved. And if you're a Christian and that's not you, you do need to repent. If you're a Christian and that's not you, you need to strive with all of your might, not because you're going to earn your salvation, but because your salvation has already been earned by Jesus. So now you're going to strive with all your might without any excuses, just get alone with God and get radical with God and say, you know what? I want to be one of those Christians that's part of the army of love. I see so little of it. I want to be one. I don't, you know what? Whatever everybody else is doing or not doing, that's up to them and God. For me, 
I want to radically follow Jesus and take up my cross daily and love others and do that in a way that Jesus would want me to do it. And to do that with how I speak to them, how I touch them, and how I serve them. It's very, very simple. Yes, it's hard to do. In fact, in some ways, it's impossible to do. But Jesus said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So, if you're out there and you have never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, or perhaps you're somebody who's walked away from the faith for a while, right now you have the opportunity to come afresh to Jesus or to come to Jesus for the first time. I mentioned the gospel earlier to you. The content of the gospel is Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's the gospel. That's where your hope is. That's the truth. What happens now is what you do is you cry out to God like the tax collector did in Luke chapter 18, who says, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. And that's what you say to God. I'm a sinner. Have mercy upon me, God. And Jesus said this about that particular sinner. He said, that guy went home justified. We talked about justification earlier. He's declared righteous. Sins washed away. He's given the record of Jesus. Now that that's happened, now go and follow Jesus. Romans chapter 10 says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And that's what you do. So wherever you are, if you're in the Middle East or in Africa, if you're a Muslim or a Hindu or an atheist or agnostic, if you're a Christian who's walked away from the faith, if you're just a nothing, you come to Christ right now. You profess what God has already done in your heart by his grace. You, you can cry out on your own right now where you're at. Get alone in a closet and you just cry out and say, Father, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on that horrible cross for all my transgressions and all my sins, all my iniquities. This I believe and I affirm and I profess. And I believe that God raised them from the dead on the third day. This is what I believe and this is what I commit to. I give him my heart and my life. Lord Jesus, take me, I'm yours. And if you've been listening, we really appreciate it. This will be um, uploaded on YouTube this week. That's where we have our largest audience. We appreciate it. if you could go to our Cross and Crown station on YouTube, where we have our largest audience. If you could subscribe, that really helps. It really, really helps. <clears throat> and um, we thank you so much for all you that have been giving. If you want to give to this uh, radio work <clears throat> and podcast, as well as the church planning, all you have to do is go to alccgranberry.com and go to the donation button. That's alccgranberry.com. Or you can text 84321 and go to Life Church. Give as you would have. 84321. But you know what? You guys have helped out so much. I really, really appreciate it. We're not going to push or beg for money. We're just going to say, you know, keep doing what God has put on your heart. We don't want anything else but that. And if you have any questions or comments, if you come to Jesus tonight or you've rededicated your life, if you say, you know what, I need a Bible, I would tell you, go on your smartphone if you have one or your computer. You can uh, get an app, a Bible app for free. There's many of them. Get that. If you need a physical Bible, go ahead and uh, message us on Facebook or when this gets on YouTube, give us a comment or email. We'll make sure you get a Bible. And any of the books that we have, if you can't afford them, we give them to you for free. If you can't afford them, I appreciate your purchasing them. Those also help the ministry. 42 books on Amazon you can get. The latest one that I wrote is Fake Atheism. And then I also wrote one recently called Science Requires God by Mike Robinson. Uh, the, the stellar book that most people like is God Does Exist, uh, also found on Amazon by Mike Robinson. I appreciate it. And of course, until next time, I, I just pray that God would richly bless you. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Hey guys, please subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot.
Additionally, don't forget to join our Full Access Media Experience. We want you to know that Cross and Crown Full Access is now available for just $7.99 a month. Full Access provides an enjoyable Christian media experience. Every day we produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for you on demand. Sign up for Cross and Crown Full Access and get every television show, the after show, a free book monthly, and all our academic work at your command. All just one click away at gospeltruthshow.podbean.com. Help us reach the world.